Acts chapter 5. Acts 5. We're going to start in verse 12. Now, what I got out of Mark's announcement about the pies was that I need to schedule all my doctor's appointments around major holidays. That's what I got out of that. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> that a couple of great songs this morning, those that we sung, but also uh, Arise, My Love. That, that, if you've never heard that before, uh, go Google Halal, H-A-L-L-A-L, and Arise, My Love, and listen to that whole song. It's just absolutely fantastic. And then uh, this one that we just sang, God Works in a Mysterious Way. There are a lot of things uh, that we could... Uh, celebrate having gotten rid of the British here, here in the United States, right? But we can also celebrate some of our greatest songs were written by Christians in England over the last five, six hundred years. And it, when a song hangs around for centuries, you know it's touching hearts and, the, and that the words connect. And the stories just help connect all that much more. And there's so many good ones. One of the things that's kind of cool, and we've sung some of them already over the last few years, is there are now also Christians in the UK that are trying to get back to that kind of a deep, rich hymn writing, and they're writing new songs, but kind of with deeper lyrics than, you know, the same three words 17 times like the Americans write, so it's kind of cool, pretty neat. Uh, let's uh, pray before we get into God's Word. Father, we are grateful for Christians past and present. We're thankful for the gifts and the sacrifices, the use of their gifts, that encourage us, strengthen us, give us the words of our heart to sing. And Father, we pray that you guide us as we also now study in your word, translated by people over centuries, so that we could hear it in our heart's tongue. We pray, Father, that we open up our hearts to what you have to say to us and how you would call us to live and to be. We pray that you work on our character, on our strength and our courage. And Father, we pray that through your church, the world sees Jesus in what we do, in what we say, and in how we do it and in how we say it. It's in your Son's name that we pray and that we offer this gift of sacrifice to you. Amen. Acts chapter 5, a little bit of background. If uh, you haven't been with us, we're going through the book of Acts. And even though we're just a chapter 5, there's already a lot that's happened. You have Pentecost has happened. God has blown open the gates to the church and called people into the kingdom of God and shown them the Messiah of Jesus Christ. And Peter gets up on Pentecost and preaches this sermon. 3,000 people, well actually it says 3,000 men. We don't know how many people because uh, there would also have been women baptized and younger people not yet called men baptized. And so we have thousands upon thousands of people and over the next few days and weeks to where by the time we get to chapter 5 we don't even know how many several thousands have been baptized, but we know a couple of chapters ago it had already gotten up to 5,000 men. Just people constantly, every day, meeting together, praying together, serving together, eating together, in their homes, around the Lord's Supper table, and spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to their friends, their family, and their neighbors. That got a lot of attention. It got good attention. People are, are opening up their hearts and minds to the gospel. And God is opening up people's hearts and minds to the gospel. And they're being baptized and they're coming to faith. And they're wanting to know, who is this Jesus you guys are so excited about? What are you talking about? And, 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 and is, is this stuff really real? And so they would meet with people all over town in homes and at the temple courts every single day to answer questions, to show them where in the scriptures, which at that point ended at Malachi, um, to show them in the scriptures who Jesus was, is, and always will be, and who they could be if they were in Christ. And they responded like crazy. They responded so enthusiastically and dramatically that the people who were the religious leaders and the powers to be that day start going, no, I don't think I like this. These people are getting a little bit too enthusiastic, a little bit too excited, a little bit too into this Jesus guy. And we already thought we got rid of him and we've had enough trouble with him. We don't need 5,000 more little Jesuses running around all over the place. And they get scared. They get jealous. They're afraid that their power base will somehow crumble because for some of them, that's what it was really all about. Pride, power, and position. And so they feel threatened. We'll come back to that. They feel threatened. 
But you know who doesn't feel threatened? The disciples. We saw just in, in chapters 3 and 4, Peter and John go to the temple. They meet a guy who is lame from birth, just over 40 years. And they are asked for a little bit of help. You know, and so he, he says, hey, could you give me a hand here? I need something to eat. And they say, look at me. And Peter says to him, I tell you, well, actually, first, I, I don't want to skip my favorite part. He says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the man is healed, and he gets up, and he doesn't just walk. He runs, he jumps, he praises God. And unlike us this morning, that man did raise hands. I am sure of it that he did. Okay? I'm sure of it. Uh, what Mark meant by that is that we don't, not that we can't. So, you know, right, Dale? Amen. All right, I knew I'd get an amen from Dale. Dale likes to put his hands up, and that's all right. He's setting, in us, setting us an example. He runs around and he praises. Well, these people who are already scared and already nervous and already jealous, they're not liking this. But there's one thing they're never able to do. They try to silence the disciples. They tell Peter and John, and they threaten them. They tell them to shut up and quit and go away, and it doesn't work. Because Peter, as you know, looks at them and says, well, you know, got to do the Jesus thing. I cannot not speak about what I've seen and what I've heard. He goes back. They tell the, the other disciples exactly all that had happened. And what do they do? They pray, and they pray for boldness. And they ask God, please hide us from these men. No, that's not what they said. God, please just help us not to know what we're up to. That's not what they said. God, please help us to move to some place like Texas or Oklahoma so that I can just... No, that's not what they said. Lord, please give us, you know, a governor or a president. And that's not what they said. They said, God, we don't understand what their problem is, but help us to go out here and just be even bolder. And the house shook. And they walked out and they preached the word of God. And they got the attention again didn't they, of these people. And that's where we are in verse 12. Let's look at this. And by the way, this, the church just spread like crazy. Then they had the whole Ananias and Sapphira thing? And even that didn't scare, well, it scared some people, but it didn't scare them away from Jesus. It just made them take things that much more seriously and gain them some perspective. Verse 12, Many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Did you hear that? People were scared to death, but more than ever, people were added to the Lord. Maybe, just maybe, we're oversensitive about being forthright about the seriousness of the difference between lost and saved. Maybe we've softened ourselves too much because we're afraid people won't come to Christ if we're honest about the eternal price of rejecting Jesus. I don't know. It seemed to grow their church. Isn't that something? And there's a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it. But you do it is the key, correct? That had better get an amen from God's people or all y'all going to be in trouble. I'm going to change my outline. You better be telling people about Jesus. That's what he said, right? And being honest about it when you do. Dale? Amen? Amen. Okay, I got Dale. I got Dale. Dale and I are in on it. Okay. More than ever, they were added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. And the people also gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. Now up to this point, as they've been threatened against and intimidated and questioned and told that if you don't stop this, we're going to bring the hammer down on you. All they've done is gotten that much more bold. Now, just to be fair, these are real live humans and real live Christians. And they, it's not that they were not scared. Remember, they prayed for boldness. What do you pray for? What you do not have, right? Right? You pray for what you need more of. 
So when we read about the apostles and the, and the disciples gathering together to pray for boldness, we know that that means that just in and of themselves, they did not see themselves as some kind of superhuman or super Christian. They saw themselves the same way that you see yourself. But what if? But what if? But I don't know. I don't I, How? And all of those questions that run through your heart and that run through your mind, the fears that run through your heart and run through your mind, the intimidation of it all that runs through your heart and your mind. They had that too, but they prayed for boldness. And that tells us something else. We can do that too. If we can be afraid like them, we can pray like them. If we can pray like them, we can be blessed like them. If we can be blessed like them, we can be bold like them. And if we can be bold like them, we can be fruitful like them, right? Good night. I'm going to go down the street. I'm going to go down the street and I'm going to tell you. And they're going to come back and say amen for you. This, is, this must have been the kind of Sunday morning Jesus said the rocks were going to cry out. He was like, can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, that you amen, you like rocks. That, did you catch that part? Okay, here we go. So Acts chapter 17, verse 17. The priest, high priest rose up and they get jealous and they get angry and they call them in, Right? But look at this. Look at what happens. Peter says to the... Uh, I just looked at the wrong thing, but it was still Peter. Verse 18, They arrest the apostles, put them in public prison, but during the night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to preach. This is not insignificant. And the, the greatest significance of this is not the miracle. It's pretty cool that the Lord lets them out, just goes in there and opens up the keys and, or the doors and lets the apostles out so that they can go preach. That's pretty cool. The miracle is neat. But which is a bigger miracle? God sending an angel with a key to a lock or a disciple who's threatened going out and speaking with boldness, who's supposed to be in a jail cell. Yeah. Because which would be the bigger miracle if you had been the one in the jail cell? Would you be scared to walk out that door? I mean, you'd be excited. You'd be emboldened by the presence of an angel. But when the angel gives you the instructions, I want you to go right back out there, right into those temple courts, and God wants you to speak the gospel. And you say, all right, because you've got an angel with you, right? And then the angel goes... Then what do you do? Oh, wait a minute. I thought he was, did you, you wonder if they talked about it? Wait, didn't you think he was coming with us? Did, did you think, did you think maybe he was going to, wait, what? I, we got to go by ourselves? But we don't have that conversation. It could have happened. I have no idea. What we have is faithful obedience. They believed in the God who set them free. I'm convinced that sometimes the church is not as effective as it could be and should be, not because we're not able, not because we don't even have the gifts or the skills that we need to do it, but because we're still not quite sure. Will God protect us? Will God lead us out? Will He open the doors? Will He open hearts? Will He open eyes when we share the gospel? We should know by now, even just by chapter 5. The answer is yes. God will. The question is, Will we? That's always, the, it just always comes back to that, isn't it? I've never struggled, and I know some do, and I'm not saying good, bad, better, worse. I've never struggled with faith in what God could do. Never. Never. I have struggled often, if not always. By often, I mean about every three minutes on a good day. I have struggled with faith in myself. They didn't walk out the door because of faith in themselves, though, did they? They walked out the door because they believed that despite what they felt about themselves, God would, God can, and God does. So you just go. It's an incredible freedom that comes with knowing what God can do and not worrying about what you can and cannot do. And for that reason... Every time there was pressure put on them, things just got better. 
That's why the church just kept getting better. So that they would threaten and the church would go out more. They would threaten and the church would pray for boldness and go out more. Then they would threaten again and they'd say, So, my favorite Medea quote. Any of y'all watch those movies? I have only watched one. Most of them are too long for me. Uh, but my favorite quote, you can blame Julia Evans for this, because uh, Donnie was telling me how much she loves these movies. And I said, well, I guess I need to see one of them. And so I watched this one. And she was quoting, eh, kind of, quoting scripture to somebody, which she calls the prescriptures. She said, you know, the problem with you Christians is you don't know your prescriptures. If you knew your prescriptures, you'd know what to do. And she told her friend, she said, Anytime that somebody says something you don't like, you just say, well, the righteous and the, or, excuse me, the redeemed and the Lord say so. But she said, the redeemed and the Lord say so. <laughs> That's not the way the scripture really means it at all. But I love it. And so now, like Julia Evans, now I quote this all the time. Well, the, the redeemed and the Lord say so. <laughs> I don't care. You know, That's, though, the attitude we need to have, isn't it? When Satan tries to throw up every possible barrier, we ought to just say to Satan, well, the redeemed of the Lord say, so? I don't care about your barriers. I don't care about your fears. I don't care about your threats. I don't care about your jealousy. We're going forward. Now, you might have already read that note up there. Let me explain. So often, Satan does not have to, in our context and in our time, does not have to threaten us. He does not have to intimidate us. He does not have to uh, put us in prison. Satan has figured out a different trick for all different kinds of cultures and places. And what he uses for us is not gel cells. He uses for us lazy boys, stands, concert seats, work, desks, and everything else we can think of. The other day, a friend and I were talking about junk food. And you know, we were talking about that the problem is that our country makes some of the highest quality junk food in the world. Okay, We like to think we're number one in a lot of things. Like medical care, we think we're number one. None of the outcomes prove that in any way whatsoever because nobody listens, right? <laughs> we might have the best advice and the best treatments, but none of us do that stuff. I read uh, just yesterday, 90% of heart patients, and see if this sounds right, 90% of heart patients, when they are told that they must change their habits or die, choose to die instead of change. Does that sound accurate? Mark said that's pretty accurate. I don't know which nine out of ten of you he was talking about, but, but he said it's pretty accurate. It is, isn't it? We don't like to change. But we were talking about this junk food and, and how hard it is, you know, because we have such high-quality junk food to, to really put it all aside. And you think about things like Blue Bell, and I probably offended three people calling it junk food, but it is. But you think about, like, Blue Bell and Fritos, I mean, these are just, in, that's just Texas. Texas makes some pretty good junk food. And then you, put, get, you get Fritos, and you know what's really good on Fritos? You're going to say wolf brand chili, and I'm going to say no, brisket. And you put brisket on, I mean, people do all kinds of crazy things, don't they? And that's, the nine, that's what the 90% are not willing to give up. We're not willing to change that stuff. He distracts us with high-quality junk food, and not just in the air, arena of food. As I mentioned, entertainments, distractions. You think about the high-quality distractions that God puts, or not God, that Satan puts before us every single day. Things that we will say, he, God can't want me to cut back on that. There's just no way, because that's just such a, it's such a great thing. I enjoy it so much, and my family loves it so much, and, 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 and. But we re and we resist because we think, well, but there's nothing morally wrong with that. And I think he gets us more with things that are morally neutral than he does with things that are truly morally evil. Because all he has to do is keep us preoccupied, and he kills our mission. I think he's figured out that if he pushed hard through evil we'd actually bow up and say, oh, no, you don't. But if he can frog in the kettleus with high-quality distraction, the early church was the early church because they didn't have Netflix, right? The early church was the early church because they didn't have air conditioning. You know, seriously, they've done studies on the impact of air conditioning 
on society. And of course, there are many, many good, good things. I love it. There are many good things about it, but we're not as neighborly. We're not out on our porches visiting with each other anymore. It's a direct correlation. We roll up our windows and won't even talk to people. Uh, if they're standing right outside our car, we're not going to let that cool out, right? In so many ways, our high-quality distractions, more than resistance, keep us from being this kind of a bold, outgoing, serving, gospel, soul-winning church. So be careful about those things because in the end, no matter how good they are, how good they taste, what a wonderful time you had, or how many times you loved seeing those pictures every year when they popped back up on Facebook, the Lord knows the difference between high-quality distractions and His actual work, right? He knows, and really so do we. Let's get back to these threatened guys because I've already, that's, that's enough of that, right? Let's get back to them because we'd, be, we'd rather talk about the Sadducees and their problems. The powers were threatened. They could see that if the church became as influential as they seemed to be in those first weeks and they became that way forever, that's going to be a problem. It's going to ruin their life, their power, and the hold that they had on things because the Sadducees, as much as they were a religious organization, really sought political and monetary power and they were constantly protecting that and feeling like they were doing it in the Lord's name, but they, they were really all about themselves. So they want to just shut the apostles down. They don't listen to them to hear them out. Odd, because they claim to be believers. The Sadducees were not people who were atheists. They weren't like that. These were people who said they were believers in Jehovah God. And yet, as believers, they said, in Jehovah God, they refused to hear, could the Messiah, this man who claims to be the Messiah, could he actually be? Even to the point that they look at this man healed, after being lame from birth, cannot deny, even though the Sadducees did not believe in miracles, they believed that that didn't happen anymore, could not deny the miracle. Couldn't deny it. They don't even try. They don't argue against it. They don't break out an outline of why this cannot be a miracle. They have to accept it, but they will not hear the apostles out on why they're doing what they're doing and believe what they believe and are proclaiming what they are about Jesus. They were hard-headed, hard-nosed, and hard of heart. And when you get any one of those problems, that can be salvational. Not because God's trying to kick you out, but because you'll pull yourself out of His kingdom. And that's what happened with the Sadducees. They would not listen to what they were trying to say. I've done that. Rejected things out of hand. Because I hear it, and it's not what I already think. Now, I know that I'm not the only one who does that, because that's half the reason y'all didn't amen earlier. You know, I don't think that, right? So, I know all about that. I've seen that before. Done that, though, before. It's easy to get into a mindset that we've already, let's say it's a scriptural thing, we've already studied this, and I've already got six outlines in my word processor on why that's incorrect. Can't be right. No disciple of Jesus gets away with following their own outlines for a lifetime and still considering themselves faithful because no one is that right that often. We're just not. We're just not. Through our lifetimes, it is normal, natural, and healthy to go back and look at what we believe about God and about Jesus and about what He taught and what the implications of that are, it is normal and natural for us to go back and do that, and it's unhealthy not to. Just think about all the things where you've had to change your mind, whether it's religious or otherwise. When I was a kid, I thought butter on pancakes was just nearly sinful. Just nearly sinful. Butter on pancakes made me want to do something else on my pancakes. Gross, disgusting, hated it. Now, I don't eat pancakes because there's so much sugar and butter in the pancakes when I do them. <laughs> I want all that on there. But I, I just don't, I don't eat them anymore, hardly at all. Butter, I have changed my mind. I was wrong about butter. It's, it's all right. It's good, you know? And I don't, you can't eat a whole lot of it. Do it in moderation, but... 
Kick that margarine to the curb and get yourself some butter. Good night. The way the Lord made it, fresh squeezed, right? Fresh squeezed. That's the way butter ought to be. If it ain't been through some kind of part of a cow, it ain't right. Anyway, that, I'm not getting any more detail than that, Patsy. You ain't got to worry about a thing. <laughs> okay. We've been wrong about so many things. I could make a long list of things that I've had strong convictions about, about what Jesus said and about what I thought that meant. That it, I look at that now, and I don't even think about it as something, you know, I used to think that or teach that or believe that. Some of them I look at that and I go, why would anybody think that? And then I have to go, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I got those five outlines back in the word processor, right? I've taught that. I believe that at some point. And I don't say that to say, you know, we need to, you know, just start throwing off everything we ever thought. I think that's very unhealthy as well. You throw out the baby with the bathwater when you do that. And a lot of us have done that. In fact, some of the things where I've had to change my mind, it was things that we as a body in, in the big picture rejected, but we were, we, were, we were too quick to do so. And we've had to backstep and go, well, okay, we were too harsh on that for a while, and we really weren't right about that. So you don't just throw everything out, but you carefully, thoughtfully listen to what God's doing, even when uh, he comes in ways that we, we didn't expect. Sometimes God is going to do things that just don't fit our little outline. And so we're going to say at first, well, that can't be right. We can't do that because I've got my outline. And yet if God is in it and if God is doing it, these Sadducees wouldn't hear that. They wouldn't hear it. And, and yet that is exactly what was going on. God was speaking to them and through them and trying to, to wake them up to the reality of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and they wouldn't hear it because it would mean change. And they were part of the 90%. It was going to mean change. How many things in our life do we read Scripture, plain, easy to interpret Scripture, Things God wants us to do, ways He wants us to act, things He wants us to avoid, and we refuse because we've already got dead set habits, and it's change or die, and we choose to, to what? To die? How many people have been called into the waters of baptism over and over again by God and by their family and by neighbors and brothers and sisters, potentially, in Christ? But they refuse to go into the water because... But that might mean I have to change. I've got things I want to do, and I, 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 gotta, I want to get those done first. That is deadly game, folks. A deadly game. That's the game they play. There were arguments that should have won them over to Christ as Messiah. They were winning people over like them by the thousands. By the thousands. But they were that stubborn and that afraid to change. Gamaliel gets up. Let's read this. Uh, jump down to verse 27. We're going to skip a little bit. <clears throat> When they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Let me just say, let me just say, wouldn't it be awesome if the accusation people could bring to us was, we told you to stop talking about Jesus, and here you fill the entire county with Jesus' name. You've talked to everybody. We can't even go to Hess or Underwoods without finding somebody that you've been talking to about Jesus. And I talked to my wife this morning. They said, well, you talk, why don't you talk to her too? Wouldn't that be a great accusation? That nobody can get away from hearing about Jesus just because this church is in its presence and in its community? This, is, this happened. Again, same kind of people, same kind of God, same kind of mission, same kind of possibility. There's no difference between them and us. Just faithfully obedient. That's it. That's it. You have filled Jerusalem. They had more people to tell than we do, too. Isn't that something? I'll go on. Let's see. Verse 29. 
No, let's go to 28. We strictly charge you not to teach in his name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. Do you see what he's doing again? This is the third time that he repeats Pentecost sermon again. It gets shorter each time. I know what y'all are thinking. Y'all just keep thinking it. Uh, but it gets shorter each time. But he still just comes right back down to it again. You know that Jesus? You know the one that you killed, the one you crucified, the one you put on a tree. That Jesus, the one who he says at Pentecost, this one who is both Lord and Christ. Well, he's going to give them the same sermon. God exalted him, verse 31, at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now this is something because they've just said, you want to put his blood on us. And Peter actually makes it better than that. He says, well, yes, it was your fault. <laughs> he doesn't let him off the hook. Yeah, you're the ones who killed him. But do you understand why God let you do that? It was for your forgiveness. Peter says, yes, we're not letting you off the hook, but we actually want you, and God wants you to be saved. This was never about coming here to judge you. It was always about coming here to save you. That's a cool message Peter gets to present to the leader of Israel, isn't it? We are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. That is not the reaction people want when they spread the gospel, is it? They got so angry, they were ready to kill him. I read about a preacher that uh, was trying to help this couple out and, and was working with them and giving them a place to stay and all of this. And then one day he goes to them and he was having a deal with something that was a problem. And uh, the, the, the elders of his church said, you know, will you go over there and talk to him about this? He goes over and he says, you know, we need to talk to you about this and da 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 And he says what the problem is. And the guy does not repent, the guy does not say, you know, thank you so much for, you know, for bringing this to me, and I'm really sorry, and let's work on this. No, the guy lunges at him with both hands around the guy's neck and wrestles him to the floor and tries to kill him. Wife has to pull him off. Another person was over there going, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, you know, because <laughs> they were like, I think he's got a demon, because that's how angry he got. So angry, the guy almost changed his views on demon possession. These men were that angry. Immediately, they start saying, how can we get these people dead? And then Gamaliel, a voice of reason, speaks up. A teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, take care that what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutius, or, or Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I will tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or this undertaking is for man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them you might even be found opposing God. Now, the first part of his statement we're not going to ignore. His first thought is, you know, this could be nothing. This could be just another rabble-rouser like these other ones we've had before, you know, and, and it's kind of like, you know, don't call in the ATF, leave Koresh alone, let him putter out, right? Or you can have Waco. That's kind of what's going through, through uh, Gamaliel's mind. Do we, want, do we want what happened at Waco, or do we want to just let this fizzle? And he says, we've had guys before, and they all turned out to be fake. And then he says, but maybe God was speaking through Gamaliel. He speaks sometimes through the one who is still opposed to you. But if this is of God, if this plan or this undertaking is from God, you'll be fighting God. 
You're not going to overcome this. And here we are, 2,000 years later, and who won? Who won? The Sadducee party, the Sanhedrin, the Roman Empire, or Jesus and His kingdom? And who will win in 2021? Jesus. And who will win should He not come back as soon as we'd like, right? In 2521, in 3021, in 3521, if the Lord is as patient with everybody else as He's been with us. Jesus. Jesus. So what are we afraid of? That's what Peter asks. What, what would we be afraid of? Peter never does in any of this back down. Instead, here's what the disciples do. He gives that advice in verse 41, after they're let go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They left saying, isn't that cool? We just got to be punished like Jesus. We got the, we, we got the Sadducee talk like Jesus used to get. Did you see that? They were almost as mad at us as they were that time that he healed the blind man in John 9. It was so cool. Did you notice that one over on the left? He was so mad, he was actually spitting and drooling. He had a vein going up his head. You know they told those stories. Because they were excited. Not because they made somebody mad. But because they had gone up against the forces of evil and won. They won. They won simply by being faithful and continuing in their mission. Every day, verse 42, every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. That the anointed one is Jesus. That the Messiah is Jesus. They would not stop. Peter had already said we cannot not speak about what we have seen and about what we have heard. That's faith. When we get into hard times, we do the fight or flight thing, don't we? Problem is that fight and flight aren't always either one of them the great way. And I understand some of that's really hardwired, and, and that has to do with that five-year-old thing too. Fight or flight is a fight. Yeah, that stuff starts to cement. Start cementing around three is good and hard by five, six, seven. By seven, you, it's, extru it's as difficult as changing a 40-year-old's mind about whether you are a fight or a flight type person. What if there is a better way than that? What if faith is better than fight or flight? You may never, have never looked at it or thought about it in this way. What if when there is conflict, whether it's over spreading the gospel or anything else, what if we went with faith instead of fight? What if we just trusted God? Did not try to fight fire with fire. We see that happening right now. A lot of people in the country, angry over the way things have gone, are trying to fight fire with fire. They've decided if people are going to hate on us, we're going to hate back. If they're going to speak out of spite against us, we're going to speak out of spite against them. If they're going to be tacky and rude, we're going to be tacky and rude. If they're going to be a jerk, I'm going to be a jerk. And what does that get us except lost again? What does that get? It certainly doesn't represent Jesus Christ, who never did that. Even when Jesus was angry, he never did that. That's why James has to warn, in your anger, do not sin. You don't fight fire with fire. No matter how hardwired you were at 5, 7, or 47, when you went into the waters, you decreed, declared, and promised, God, whatever you need to change in me, get at it. You agreed to be the 10% who hear change or die and change. You tie 10%, you tie it to yourself, your personality the way you deal with things. You said, this is the Lord's now, and He's going to handle it the way that He wants to handle it in me. They were victorious, not because they learned how to fight. They were victorious because they learned how to be faithful, even when the world wanted to fight. 
We see it in Jesus' life. We see it in theirs. They were at peace. The reason they could go out and rejoice was because they were at peace. They knew God was in control. They knew God was going to take care. They knew God was going to lead, equip, and bear fruit through them. And they were seeing it every single day. Every single day. And so they didn't flee. When the jail was thrown open by an angel, they didn't look for an escape hatch. They looked for a to-do list, a mission plan, which was to go to the temple and to preach the word of God again. And because of that, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy, and they were counted worthy. They weren't counted worthy because they were such superhero men. They weren't counted worthy because of the works, though praise the Lord for the things they did in his name, but because they believed. They believed in Jesus, and that belief became a trust, and that trust became action. They were honored because they weren't just putting on airs of being a Christian. They weren't pretending like Ananias and Sapphira to be more generous than they were, more active than they were, or more uh, ambitious for the kingdom than they were. They simply went out and trusted God and answered the call and spread the word and loved and served in the name of Jesus. That's how God changes the world. It's how he changes your life. It's how he changes where you work and where you live. It's how he changes everything. In the positive sense, the yeast of the Holy Spirit works through the whole dough when you trust God and start just faithfully, obediently, doing whatever small thing he asks you to do today and just saying, yes, God, I'll do it because I trust you. I may need some extra boldness. I may need a little more courage. I'm going to need some strength. may need to learn some things. But yes, God, I'll do that. This is the morning you're ready to say yes to God and finally put him on in baptism, put Christ on in baptism. We are ready to do that uh, this morning. If you need prayers of the church, uh, whether you are online and you need to send those to us, call, drop by here at the office, or you're here this morning. If you're here this morning, we'll pray with you right here, right now. Or you can meet one of our elders at the back. Let's, let's answer the call. Let's walk by faith, and then let's just see what God does with all of this. Let's stand and sing.